It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcasting my buddy for decades, Chip Fetchner. He's the co-founder of Large Practice Sales. He does the Invisible Dental Support Organization, the IDSO Partnerships. Check this out. He's completed over a billion dollars of IDSO partnerships last 24 months. I, I love when people sit there and say, like, they work at Heartland and they don't like this. I said, dude, Rick Workman... He owns a thousand offices. Okay. Trust me, he's a hundred times smarter than you. If you disagree with someone, I want you to go find someone that's done two billion dollars. Do you know anybody, Chip, that's done two billion in the last twenty-four months? No, I'm afraid we're number one. Yeah, why you have a fishing boat, this dude has a yacht. Trust me on this. Chip Fisher is a co-founder of Large Practice Cells, the largest transaction advisor to general practitioners and specialty dental practices in the US. LPS, Large Practice Health, has completed over a billion dollars in the last 24 months. The unique Large Practice Sales bidding process ensures dentists consider all of their options in an IDSO partnership and achieve the highest value from the right IDSO partners. Um, So um, it's the largest advisor to dentists of all specialties and monetizing all or part of their practice value. Um, Practice values are setting new records for the right practices. Chip, before we even start, I want to go completely off the record and start in the wrong place. But um, I'm hearing a lot of dentists saying, um, I don't know, the economy. I mean, you know, something it's going to crash, something it's good. What do you think of the general dental economy in, in the United States? I know we have homies from around the world listening, but but is does is this economy sound solid? Does it sound like, you know, Warren Buffett's sitting on $195 billion in cash? Is it time to hide the money under the mattress? What, what's your view of the economy right now in dentistry in the U.S.? You know, I'm old. I'm 64 years old, so I take a very conservative view of the world, honestly. The, the reality is uh, we look at 1,500 sets of dental practice financials every year. And there is a distinct bifurcation between those which are growing rapidly, and there are many of them, those which are stagnant, which is a lot, and the ones that are declining. And the challenge is that the the groups that are declining, and keep in mind, we're not always looking at revenues, we're looking at operating profit. But the, uh, you know, inflation has has killed a lot of dental practices because the cost of labor has gone up. The reimbursement rates have not. Cost of supplies has gone up. It, it's becoming, there's some compression going on in margins. And that's ultimately not good for the values of practices. But it, it's it's all over the map. There's, you know, we, we have a, a Peter Ortho client up in New England that grew 24% last quarter. And this is a $20 million practice. And they grew 24% in one quarter. So it depends on where you are and what you're doing. Well, you know, they say with malls in the poor areas, you know, 60% of them are shrinking, going out of business. But in the rich areas like Scottsdale, you know, they're booming. Do you, do you see that? Is it more on median household income practices doing better or is it regional in the country? How do you say it bifurcates no, on it's what? A, it's about the dentist management of his practice and his team. The number one thing that we see are dental practices that are overstaffed. They have more people than they need. And, and, and we're looking at these statistics every day, but I, I would bet you that 80% of the dental practices we look at are overstaffed. And do you have any staffing metrics? Like for each dentist, there should be so many receptionists, assistants, hygienists. You, you, you can't be that uh, prescriptive because it depends on what procedures they're doing. It depends on what procedures they're doing, the payers they're taking, and where they are. So there's really no general rule of thumb of you should have X number of team members per dollars of revenue. We, we can do that in orthodontics in that we, we can basically – count the number of girls on an orthodontist website and go, oh, we can guess that this practice is doing X, Y, Z in revenue. But uh, in dentistry, there's the, 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 the great thing I get to do is I get to talk to 10 dentists every day, six days a week. And so I learn something every day. I mean, I, I have a client in Manhattan who does a million seven in collections per chair. He has four chairs. So think about that. If you're not in Manhattan, you can't really do that. So the answer is it's very diverse. Dentistry is an amazing business in that you have great practices that are all different. And um, 
One of the things the young kids always ask you, remember, at least a quarter of our viewers, they're, they're still in dental kindergarten school. Um, they, they, they're always asking if you, Chip, if you were graduating from dental school day, would you stay and do a specialty? Is, is it just better economics to be a specialist? You're, you're selling a lot of specialty practices and general dentist practices. What do you, what do you think? I mean, would you stay the extra two or three years and specialize? Is it worth it? Or, or you can go out there and get mean and lean in uh, in general practice. And, you uh, know, again, it depends. So our, our biggest transaction last year from a dollar, a dollar standpoint was $43 million for a 39 year old GP with one office that he started from scratch. He's 39. He's a GP. He is not a specialist. So the answer is it depends on what your goal is and what kind of practice you have. But no, there, there are great GP practices that are making more than specialists. There are some specialists that are making more than GP practices. It's it's all about what the doctor's goals are. Okay. And then the other question is, um, there seems to be a huge difference between rural and urban dentistry in America. Some, a lot of people believe the DSOs, the big major DSOs only play in the urban areas because it's hard for them to find a dock in the box and, and, you know, some little town of 5,000. Um, do you, do you see a big difference between the economics of rural dentistry versus urban dentistry? Yeah. The rural practices are usually more profitable. And so it, <laughs> well our, said. It, no, it really, they <laughs> yeah, are. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we, we just, uh, we just completed a transaction in the middle of nowhere, Missouri this morning at $15 million. We have another client in the middle of nowhere, Iowa, that'll get $20 million. Our biggest deal last year was in Missouri, Springfield, Missouri at $43 million. So here's our definition of rural. You must be less than 60 minutes from an airport that has commercial airline service. So if you if you look at the map, there really aren't that many rural practices. You must 60, be 60 minutes from an airport? 60 minutes from an airport with commercial service. Did you did you go down to Springfield, Missouri? Hell yeah, many times. I did not fly did, commercial, did, did, did but you yeah. You see a highway, you know where Highway M is? I do not. Anyway, it's anyway on Highway M. There's a uh, there's a golf course, and then there's a little uh, Carmelite monastery, and uh, that's where my sister's a nun. She, really? She, and she's two years older than me, and she went in there I think when she was like eighteen. It's like a voluntary life sentence to pray. And uh, well, my client went, there, thirty nine years old, built a twenty nine thousand square foot practice. Damn. Twenty nine thousand square. How many feet. operatories? 36 maybe i mean he didn't open with that he just grew to that over no, the years. He, he grew to that and he he built he moved in in may of the covid shutdown he's like oh great it's shut down so it's a great time to move in but he built it from scratch amazing practice wow um so i i gotta start you know i i got half these kids uh, you know a quarter of these kids are in dental kindergarten school they don't know anything about what you're talking about anything so Give me a review of, um, I know you always talk about um, the invisible dental support. So they're, they're going to ask you, are, are you just a DSO? Um, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, and and, and I, I'll be fair with you. I'll be fair with you. I'm a dentist, and I believe in the owner-operator model, and I always tell my homies, you didn't go to school eight years to be somebody's bitch. So why would I come out of dental school? and Why, why would I sell my DSO to you and go from owner-operator to your little bitch. Fair question. So Are you sure? Answer, I, didn't, I didn't say that too rudely. No, no, no. There's no rude in my world. And first of all, I'd like to apologize to everybody for my beard. I was uh, floating <laughs> for the last 30 days. I do not normally look like Santa Claus. I won't show you my belly that matches that description. But um, the answer is the invisible dental support organizations are different from what guys your age, Howard, and I'm older than you are, so I can pick on you, uh, the, w of what you perceived. You know, in the in the old days, the DSO was a group that came in and bought 100% um, of your practice, and you worked for them for two or three years, and they told you what to do and how to do it, and then you got to leave. Well, the invisible DSOs are very different. An invisible DSO, of, of which there are now more invisible DSOs than regular DSOs, they come in and buy anywhere between 51 and 80% of your practice for cash up front. And they then 
uh, allow you to continue to do exactly what you've been doing successfully, because that's the only reason they're interested in partnering with you. And, but they provide you with the resources of a big group. So they're not going to tell you who to hire, who to fire, what labs to use, what products to use, how to set your schedule, what procedures to do. That is not their business model. Their business model is to become a partner with a doctor who in, uh, continues to do what they've done successfully, uh, but they get the resources of a larger partner that can help them with banking, accounting, payroll, benefits, recruiting, marketing, blah, 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 blah. The doctors have complete full autonomy, not just clinical autonomy, but full autonomy. They're not gonna change your software. They're not gonna mess with your team's benefits. These groups are functionally silent partners who say, hey, look, if you become our partner, you're gonna get a couple of things. First of all, you're gonna pay 30% less for all your supplies. And then you're gonna pay 15% less for your team benefits and we're going to get you reimbursed from the insurance companies at higher rates than what you're getting reimbursed at today. So they basically are able to use their size to benefit the independent doctor and not tell them what to do or how to do it. And as an added bonus, that retained piece of ownership that you kept has the ability to increase in value dramatically. And when I say dramatically, we're, there's one of my favorite invisible DSOs, which has grown to over 700 practices, and I sold them practice number 41 about six and a half years ago. And that little doctor who at the time was 38 years old, his $2 million of ownership that he kept is going to be worth about $18 million next month in six and a half years. So you do negotiate their insurance, uh, their, their dental insurance reimbursements? The invisible DSOs do, yes. You know, keep in mind, we're just the cheesy broker, right? So our goal is to in, in introduce our clients to the invisible DSOs that are qualified bidders for them. Because keep in mind, there's a thousand of them out there. Now, we believe that 900 of those a thousand Invisible DSOs and DSOs are not qualified to bid on our practices for a variety of reasons. But, you know, our goal is to match our doctor clients with the right partner, the right silent partner. And some of these groups, we, we had a practice uh, here in Maryland recently, uh, 4 million in collections practice, all insurance. Their new partner is getting reimbursed from his insurance payers at a 20% higher rate. So his four million in collections practice is all of a sudden going to be a four point eight million in collections practice, and that entire eight hundred thousand dollars drops to the bottom line. So why do these? Um, you you say that you buy fifty one to eighty one percent. Fifty one to eighty. Yep. Fifty one to eighty. Yep. Okay, and and um and you don't buy a hundred because uh it sounds like you know Warren Buffett. You know, Warren Buffett says, uh, you know, in Berkshire Hathaway, we have a bunch of MBAs running, you know, sitting around that if we buy your business, they're going to go run Northern Pacific Railroad. They only buy profitable businesses with good management who just want to take some cash out. Maybe it's for family. Maybe it's for trust reasons. Maybe, you know, buying out a partner, divorce, whatever. Um, why are these guys, wh wh why would a dentist wake up on Monday and say, I want to sell you half my practice? Long list of reasons. So number one, risk reduction. Um, your primary asset, if you're a dentist, is probably your practice. If you have a good practice, that is your primary asset. If you get hit by a bus, the value of that practice drops precipitously, unless you have multiple associates that are doing the work. But if you're a one or two doctor practice and you get hit by a bus, the value of your practice is basically eliminated. So many doctors look at this and go, I want to reduce risk. I want to diversify my investment portfolio. I can get a record value for my practice with a lot of cash up front at today's low tax rates. Believe it or not, 20% long-term capital gains tax rates are going to look like a bargain about two years from now. So doctors are, are looking at it from a financial perspective of reduce risk, get liquidity, pay off debt, um, but really accessing the resources of an invisible DSO partner can help you grow. That's why so many of these young doctors are doing these deals. They're going, they'll help me grow. What would you say the average age is if someone sells to you? Now, keep in mind, we're not the buyer. We're the broker. We're the QC broker that's helping our clients find the right invisible DSO partner. 
And again, there are a thousand invisible DSO partners out there. We consider only a hundred of them qualified to bid on our clients, but uh, each one is different. So There's a thousand out there and you only work with how many? Less than a hundred. Less than a hundred Be because you just don't agree with the other Mac, the, the, their philosophy. It's just not a good philosophical fit. <sighs> You know, it, it could be philosophical fit, it could be management, it could be strategy, but most importantly today, it's money. You've got to understand where the money's coming from that's financing the invisible DSO's growth. Because if you don't have the right investor, uh, that invisible DSO that you partner with may not grow. And if they don't grow, the value of the equity that you retained as ownership won't grow. And so it's, it's critical today. So there, you know, it's really interesting and most people don't know this, but in the last five months, there's been over $5 billion invested in invisible DSOs. Think about that. A billion dollars a month have been invested in these groups to go partner with great doctors from coast to coast, GPs and all specialties, $5 billion. And so fortunately that new capital has enabled us to continue to achieve record values for our clients. And where, where is that money coming? Where's, where's your money coming from? So it's a great question. Where is that money coming from? And it's really changed. So the, the, the doctor's perception of invisible DSOs or DSOs is that they're all backed by private equity. And that is just not true. We've done over $400 million of transactions with family offices in the last four years. Sovereign wealth funds from countries like Abu Dhabi have invested over a billion dollars in invisible DSOs. The world's largest conventional money manager, BlackRock, with $10.3 trillion under management, has bought two invisible DSOs in the last 18 months. So the money that is coming into dental consolidation is not just private equity. It is large, sophisticated investors that are making multiple investments in this business. And fortunately that is helping maintain the values of practices because they wanna partner with great practices and they have very, very, very deep pockets. The new investors into the dental consolidation game have deeper pockets than the private equity guys do. Okay, so I'm gonna, um, I'm, uh, I was born and raised in Wichita, Kansas. I went to Creighton because uh, you know, my, I went to Catholic school my whole life, two older sisters, nuns, and um, Creighton, um, mom loved that, it was Jesuit school, but they had a dental school. So the closest Catholic college that had a dental school was Omaha, and that's where Warren Buffett was, and uh, Berkshire Hathaway, and he came and lectured to our freshman business class when I took Business 101, and to tell you how smart I was, I thought he was the dumbest person I'd ever met in my life. I mean, I even told the teacher, I said, we're in the middle of the nifty 50 Kodak and, and, and <laughs> Polaroid. And, and he's buying C's candy and he's in Omaha. He should be in New York. And I, I got him completely backwards, but I learned to love him over the years. And, um, but anyway, he and his partner, Charlie, um, uh, Munger, who just passed away, just legends in so many dentist minds, but he's got a saying. He says that if you hear every time someone says EBITDA, Translate it to bullshit and run. He says earnings before <laughs> interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Why don't you just include labor, dental supplies, electricity, <laughs> rent, mortgage, equipment, continued education? So, uh, so first of all, is EBITDA a bad word, and is it something that dentists should focus on? Yeah, no, EBITDA is a very important word because that's how practices in my world are valued. The interesting thing about EBITDA. No, by the way, it, did you hear Charlie Munger? Did you know he used to say that and all that stuff? Of course he did. Yeah. Okay. And, okay. And may he rest in peace because he was a nice, blunt guy, and I like blunt people. Now, the question is, when you met Warren for the first time, did you load up on his stock? No. Looking back, I should have uh, dropped out of Creighton, took my $6,000 annual tuition, but put it all in Berkshire Hathaway, and then, and then moved to San Diego and just be a we're going to be, uh, be a beach bum for uh, 20, 30 years. But, you know, it, it was real. It took me a long time to come around um, on that guy uh, just because he just was the most boring. And when you're a young kid and you're 17 years old and you're, you know, you you, you want to hear all about Kodak and Polaroid and the, the Nifty 50. I mean, that was the sexiest thing in the world. And Warren had no use for the all 50 of them socks. <laughs> Yeah, but the wild thing is Warren's biggest investment is now Apple. Mr. I'm going to avoid tech. 
Yep. He's, he's evolved over the year. So so explain to my homies what EBITDA means and why it's important. And uh, Okay, so EBITDA is the operating profit of a practice after excluding interest on your loans. So doctors say, oh, no, I don't want to sell because my, my loans are hurting my value. They don't. The interest is excluded when calculating EBITDA. Depreciation, taxes, and amortization. Um, and, and very few dental practices have any amortization expense. So functionally, if you look at it, it's the cash flow of your practice. But your accountant, when you ask him what's my EBITDA, he will forget to subtract paying you. So EBITDA is after an assumption for doctor compensation. And so today, when you calculate the EBITDA on a GP practice, you need to deduct 30 to 35% for the owner doctor's actual collections that he generates. And the, you're, you are, will, in, in an ortho, you're going to deduct a, a fixed annual salary or a day rate, but you have to understand how to calculate EBITDA uh, after doctor compensation, and every group calculates it differently. But we had a, an oral surgery practice client last year that had 18 qualified bidders. And the range of how the qualified bidders calculated the EBITDA of that practice, and this was a big practice, it was 12 million in collections. The range that they calculated the EBITDA differed by over a million dollars because each one used different assumptions. Some of them, when calculating your EBITDA, will give you the benefit of their costs of supplies. We see that a lot in Invisalign cases where uh, the invisible DSOs are paying significantly less than the twelve or fourteen hundred dollars that uh, a typical dentist is paying, and and I say significantly less, such that it can change the EBITDA calculation by a hundred thousand uh, dollars. So the EBITDA calculation is very important. It's ultimately the base upon which practices are valued. Uh, or where they start the value. And then it becomes how charming is the doctor? Is he growing? Does he have a plan? Because one of the things that people forget in this business, it's not all about the numbers. It's about the people. You give me a doctor with a personality and a plan, I'm going to get them a lot more than the doctor who is a boring dentist. No offense. So who is your target market right now? It, it's somebody, and you say the, your biggest ones are general dentists, but it's just dentists who they don't want to sell out to a DSO and, and work three years and leave. Right. They just want to pull some equity out of their practice and yep. then use the resources of, um, of a invisible DSO. So you're just a broker. And yep. so there's a thousand DSOs, 900 of them you don't even work with. You, you only work with about a hundred. Is that what you said? Yep. yep. So of these hundred, so tell us the difference between these hundred and the other uh, 900 you don't work with. And is this, and this is invisible DSO, is he most likely, are they most likely going to be in the same state or the same city or the same no. area? No, it, you know, the, the great invisible DSOs are operating nationally. Some of them have a regional focus, but I, I think, so the biggest invisible DSO in the country, I won't give you a name, but I, I met with their founder, seven years ago in his conference room and in his conference room, he had a map on the board of the United States and he had practices in Alaska and Oklahoma and Louisiana and New Jersey for that matter. And he only had 41 practices. And I was like, what is your geographic concentration strategy? He said, I don't have one. All I care about is I find a great dentist who runs a great practice. And why should I care where they are? It doesn't matter. And he grew from when I met with him at 41 practices to today, he has over 700 partner practices. He's damn near a billionaire and he's 45 years old. So the, the key to a great invisible DSO is smart management, the right financial backers, uh, the proper integration team. Cause if you're going to grow fast, you need to be able to, onboard new practices quickly and the right deal structure. You know, the, that particular example, their structure was real simple. They said, look, you're going to keep ownership in your practice. You're going to get a percentage of your practices cash flow forever. And uh, therefore your performance dictates what your check is every month. Um, 
there are a lot of different structures. There are a lot of different invisible DSOs, but the first thing we look at is who's the money behind them. Then we look at what's their strategy. And then we look at the partner practices that have joined them. You know, when we see a practice that joins an invisible DSO that we have turned down as a client, uh, we get a little skeptical on the invisible DSO. So, um, you know, so, a lot of these dentists, I, I mean, I, I am, um, I mean, you get emails and letters every day about all these people wanting to buy your practice. Yep. So if you're always being approached by these multiple DSOs, um, I mean, what, what, what's, what's my homie to think about? I mean, that he just thinks you're all the same. Everybody wants to buy their practice. So how are you? Um, so you, you sound very unique. It sounds like what you do is. 90% of the DSOs, they want to buy your practice and in exchange, you become an employee. And usually the, the, the seller doesn't want to stick around that long. And, uh, and they try to hold them to the fire for like two to three years. And you're completely opposite. You, you, you want to, you're, you're like uh, Berkshire Hathaway. You're not going to buy a company unless you think the management's going to go stay for a very long forever. time. Yeah. Stay yeah. around forever. Yeah, no, you know, it's interesting. Somebody asked me a question a couple of weeks ago. They said, okay, Chip, you've did, done hundreds of uh, practice transactions over the last seven years. How many of the doctors that you partnered with an invisible DSO have left that invisible DSO? So I put my uh, team to work on that, and the answer was four. One of them died. One of them retired. One of them moved to Hawaii. And the one in Hawaii also retired. So a total of four, which is shocking in the hundreds of transactions. We've only have four doctors that are not still with the invisible DSO that they partnered with. To me, that's a huge statement about how we were successful in choosing a good partner for these doctors. And, and what resources from the invisible DSO do you think your sellers, I mean, what, what percent of them just, they just really need the cash out. Like, like I, I know no, people. No, 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 It's not just about the cash out. The cash out's great. And the cash out is taxed at 20% federal long-term capital gains. And I just want rates. to say one thing about that. Yeah. Um, the tax rates have been low for a long, long time. This and your deficits pass. are 33 trillion. So this I would look, pass. I would look for the next generation. By by the way, a very interesting piece on inflation the other day at Wall Street Journal where um the guy when they were talking about this, um it's the big inflation expert. He's had the inflation newsletter, he's on all the talk shows. I forgot his name. But anyway, he 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 really sold me that uh inflation is a generational thing. You'll have a generation of very high inflation followed by a generation of very low inflation, same with taxes. He says these these changes are generational, and he thinks this is a, a new generation where it's not going to be higher um, interest rates for longer. It's going to be higher interest rates for this generation now, and the tax rates, which were incredibly low, before that they were incredibly high, and he says they're, they're going straight back to much, much higher taxation and much, much higher uh, interest rates. No question. So, so you agree with that? hundred percent. So President Biden came out, uh, I think it was three weeks ago, and announced his tax plan for 2025. And if he gets reelected, he would like the average dentist who sells his practice to an invisible DSO or a DSO to pay a 49% average tax rate. Now, keep in mind, it's only 44% going to the feds. The other 5% is going to the average state tax rate, and 44% of the states have taxes on long-term capital gains. But And everybody goes, oh, yeah, but if he gets reelected, he will pass that in 25 and it won't be effective till 26. And I go, you know what, guys? This is the benefit of being old with a gray beard because I remember in 1993 when a little guy named Billy Clinton came out and raised the taxes right after inauguration and made them retroactive to before he was inaugurated. He was then sued by everybody and their brother. He won every one of those lawsuits and taxes were retroactive to January 1 of 1993. So uh, not to say that President Biden would do that, but you know, now is the time to consider putting liquidity in the bank. And the good news is today we get 5.4% on 30-day treasury bills. Let's put some liquidity in the bank. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, would you say um, you're an old guy? Um, 
now that COVID has been over, or, or did we pass COVID? What what was the COVID effect on the dental practice? I mean, you know, the funny thing is the COVID effect on the individual practices was not positive. You had to shut down. You had employee challenges. You had all kinds of nonsense. But the reality is the resiliency of of dental practices through COVID and post COVID is why we've had five billion dollars of new capital invested in dental consolidation in the last five months. Right? You you want to talk about a resilient business? This is a resilient business. People people would like to have great smiles, and so to me, I think COVID honestly was the best thing that ever happened to dentistry. And why is that? Well, because it, it survived, it succeeded, it surpassed. We will have higher collections in 2024 than we did in 2019. And so what it proved to investors was dentistry is extremely resilient. It's recession proof. And so the, the amount of new capital that is poured into dental consolidation in the last 150 days is staggering. I um I, I think your business model really explains the concept that, you know, when I started teaching, I got a school in 87, started teaching practice management 90 and all that stuff, and the 30-day dental MBA. And uh, I, I, I found out that, number one, no doctor knows their numbers. Like you like you were planning on meeting a doctor, he's like, yeah, I have 50% overhead. You get in there and be like 68. He's like, yeah, I collect a million. And it's like the highest he ever collected was like 780. And I mean, it's like, how did you get a million out of 780 one time? And they just round stuff off. But a lot of people sit there and say, my overhead is 50 percent, but they don't realize well they paid off their land and building and don't charge themselves rent and right. then they don't charge themselves as labor they mix the 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 money they're earning by be being a dentist working with their hands doing root canals and crowns versus the profit dollars from having capital employed in a dental office yep. so if i sell you 50 percent of 51 percent of my practice um so then so now the profit dollars where the doctor you say it's all his or hers um well now they're going to realize where there's so how do you split that up do you pay the doctor the market value of being a dentist in that area and yeah, then absolutely you, so, you gotta so, pay them a market rate to be able to calculate ebitda Right. And so it's going to, so from a GP practice, the average GP is going to get paid anywhere between 28 and 35%. Specialists have different rates all over the map. That's a negotiable number. But once you understand the tax consequences of these transactions, you really want to have the lowest compensation possible because future ordinary income at higher compensation rates is taxed at ordinary income rates. Whereas today, if you're getting a multiple of your EBITDA or your operating income, you're better off to go with a lower future income because you're going to get a multiple of seven to 10 times that uh, lack of future income upfront in cash at long-term capital gains tax rate. So ultimately, once doctors in, in my world understand the value of the multiplication, they're begging to work for free. Unfortunately, I can't sell that because the, the invisible DSOs want to compensate the doctor at a rate that's market, but market is negotiable. But remember, when you do go to IRS court, there's no jury. It's just you, the IRS judge, and you will always lose. That's yes. what my dad always says. So there's no jury. There's no jury at the IRS court. Yeah, it's just you, the judge, and you'll lose. Yes. And uh, so I want to switch um, over to specialties. You, you talk about a dental trifecta. I want to tell you one of the things I've noticed here in Phoenix that if a pediatric dentist opens and an orthodontist opens, say at the end of the first year, they're at one. They're each at one X. Okay. But if they open up together at the end of the first year, they're at three X. Because if you go to a pediatric dentist, every mom's going to say, Was, well, little Billy need braces. And then they they write you an economic barrier to entry. Here's a slip, go drive another point. Both. But if she can sit there and say, well, let's get the orthodontist to come in and look. It's right. just uh, so, so specialty. And, and then when you look at incomes, I mean, my gosh, you, you look at, um, you look at incomes. Um, the average net income for a dentist is uh, 320. A general practitioner, uh, no, dental specialist is 320. 
a general practitioner is 197. So basically 320 for a specialist and 200 for a general dentist. Dentists who own their own practice making 244. Dentists who are employees at a practice making 144. So it shows that in macro, you could make about $100,000 off an employee dentist. But man, oral surgeons are at 448. Periodontist 330. Endodontist 307. Pediatric 304. Orthodontist a little under 300. Prostodontist a little over 200. Um, so, so a couple of questions. What is a dental trifecta? And number two on dental town, a recurring thread for a million years has always been, well, you know, I'm in a rural practice. What if I had an oral surgeon come in my office once a month? Or what if I had a pediatric dentist come in my office, you know, once a week or an orthodontist? So let, let's switch over to the specialty side. Start with the dental trifecta. So the dental trifecta, um, you know, is a concept that has been executed in small ways for years, right? Pedo ortho. Uh, has is a normal combination, and that's been around for a while. But in the summer of 19, a very successful self-made multi-billionaire came to me and said, uh, I've got lots of money, and I want to get into this dental consolidation play. What should I do? And I said, what do you want to do? He said, I'd like to make a lot of money. How do I do it? And I said, well, uh, what I would do is I'd build a dental trifecta and I'd start out West. And he said, what's a dental trifecta? It's where you partner only with doctors that are pedo, ortho, or oral surgery in the same community. And the reason you do that is you're locking in your referral sources. And because each of those doctors will have ownership in the parent company, they have a financial motivation to refer their patients to each other. And he said, okay, let's go do it. So we partnered him with the, uh, as his initial launch into this uh, thing, we partnered him with the largest uh, orthodontist in Montana and Wyoming. We then added, of course, the pediatric practice and an or oral surgery practice in those towns in Montana and Wyoming. And then we partnered him with another 109 practices over 35 months. He ultimately got to 210 practices. We started in the summer of 19. And in September of 22, he recapitalized that, meaning he sold it for a value of $2 billion or 20 times EBITDA, the highest record multiple that an invisible DSO has ever been sold at, or DSO for that matter. And the reason was because you, as you added practices within the community, so for instance, we partnered 48 trifecta practices with that group in Salt Lake City which is the place to be if you like kids, because it's got the highest kids per household of, of any place in the country. So what happened was he was able by adding additional pediatric orthodontic and oral surgery practices in the same communities, they all referred to each other because they had a financial incentive to do so because they all had equity ownership in the parent company. So in his case, he made a fast half a billion dollars and uh, my doctors all made lots and lots of money. But the dental trifecta is powerful because you get patient referrals. I mean, if you look at ortho case starts in 22, they were down 8% versus 21. If you look at them in 23, they were down 6% versus 22. And in the first quarter of 24, ortho case starts down about 4% national average. So the ortho business needs pedo referrals. And if you can own your pediatric referrals, whether they're in your office or not in your office, if you're all in the same family, you're gonna to refer to each other and that drives organic growth. And organic growth is the number one thing that investors wanna see in invisible DSOs when looking at recapitalizing them. Another thing that people always ask and talk about is, uh, I mean, how many publicly traded companies are in America? 8,000? Don't yeah. hold me to that. I'm guessing. Why, why are none of these DSOs, why, why can I invest in Snapchat on, on in NASDAQ? Why does NASDAQ not cover Heartland or Aspen? Or why is it just a no-show? I mean, it almost seems like a red flag. It's like, look at how many of those crazy-ass companies are publicly traded. Thir the, I read the other day that 30% of all publicly traded companies have never made $1 in earnings yeah they're public but not one in dentistry well That's actually there is why. one publicly traded uh company in north america the dental practice group called dental corp in canada they are the only publicly traded dental practice group in the country 
And my theory of why the invisible DSOs don't go public is because if you look at the typical invisible DSO, typically over half of the equity is owned by doctors, right? It's not owned by the financiers. It's the doctors who have retained equity as a part of a transaction and therefore their owners. So if, if I'm a, a, a financial sponsor of one of these groups, I'm not sure I want to publicly show the value of my partner doctor's stock okay, I every could day. See th- I could see that for you. For the invisible DSO, but what about the visible DSO? What what about you know just your Aspen, Heartland, all, all yeah, those? Yeah, and and that's a different story, and that's a good question. The good news is they've been able to get access to all the capital they needed from the private markets, and therefore, why mess with the the nonsense and drama of the public markets? And, For the and invisible DSOs, it's I I believe it's a bad move because the doctors are looking at the value of their ownership every day. So I don't that, think that's a good thing. So could you say the answer, the reason why Rick Workman never took Heartland public was the same reason the the the, the IPOs are mostly going to private equity? I mean, the private equity, are, are they just tired of all the transparency and regulation and bullshit? And is it just easier doing business in a private <sighs> format? They're getting, they're, I mean, Rick's gotten great values across five different recapitalizations over the last 20 years. And, uh, you know, he's got private equity partners. He doesn't have to answer to minority shareholders and go through the nonsense of public filing. I think someday there will be one or two that will actually go public. But right now, the private equity groups and the family offices and the sovereign wealth funds and other investors are valuing these groups at great values and uh, why go through the nonsense of being public? I've been there. I've run public companies. It's a pain in the neck. Okay. Here's a piece of advice I've always told people about partnerships and it's a little rude, a little blunt, but I'm going to lay it on you. I said, you know, they'll, they'll sit there and say, well, me and my buddy in dental school, we we're thinking about opening up a partnership together. And I say, great, man, does does that partner you're talking about, is that like the best sex you ever have? Because when you get married, (laughs) I mean, I'm pretty sure that's why you got married. And, uh, you know, and you have the glue of sex and kids and in-laws and that fails 50% of the time. So now you're telling me you want to marry a dentist, have a platonic relationship, no sex, no children, never getting laid. I mean, that, that sounds like a divorce out of the gate. I tell people, if you want to be, have, become a partnership with someone, make sure first that they're great and bad and you could, and you just want to sleep with them every night. So how, how, how bad is that advice? Well, <laughs> and, and how does that know. advice apply to you? I mean, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to, I mean, these, these people, there are people out there saying that when you hire an associate, if they don't sign the contract to buy in at day one, they're not even, it's like, well, did you get married on your first date? How many girls did you date before you put a ring on one of their fingers? Oh, me? Only one. <laughs> so, 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 you know, it, it, it's, it's a big deal. It, it's like getting married when you it have is. a partnership. And you it don't is. get married on a one night stand. You don't get married on a weekend. I mean, nope. th- this is a big damn decision. So if if my homie contacted you and thought, well, maybe I do want to marry Chip. How long do you think this dating? H- how many dates would we go on before we got serious and and made a commitment to to go get married? So it, you know, that's actually a great question, and that's the analogy that we use every day is. When you bring in an invisible DSO partner, it's like getting married because you're not getting a check in the morning and walking out the door. You, you are potentially going to spend the balance of your career with this invisible DSO partner. So you need to look at lots of options. You know, we, we generally won't take a client unless we can bring them six qualified bidders to choose from the blondes, the brunettes, the redheads, the bald people. Uh, you know, we, we try and give them all of the options so that they can choose the partner that they're most comfortable with. But we take it a step further because that's doctor's number one concern in my business is, am I going to lose my autonomy? Are they going to tell me what to do? Am I going to have to take out the trash in the morning? I mean, it's so what we do is after we get down to the final three bidders and the doctor has met with them doing an after hours practice tour and dinner at the end of the week, we're going to put our clients on the phone with other doctors that have done transactions with this particular invisible DSO that they think they like, and they're going to have a doc to doc conversation, nobody else on the phone and ask the key questions. Okay. 
what was it like? Are you glad you did it? Would you do it again? And most importantly, did they do what they said they would do? So we call that the meet the family part of the process. Before you get <laughs> married to a girl, you want to meet the family, right? And uh, so that's what we do is we set it up so our clients meet the family long before they get engaged. And, and that's an important part of the process because our, our my clients are all very successful dentists. I mean, we, we don't deal with practices that have less than a half a million dollars a year in EBITDA. And they're smart guys with valuable practices and they want to know what the future is going to look like. So with that meet the family part of the process, you know, uh, helps them get married and stay married. So um, I would imagine one of your biggest problems is, is the doctors, you know, the, the practice is their baby. So of course they think it's worth a hundred gazillion dollars. More. More. <laughs> so how, how do you how do you value that 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 practice and and how would my home and how much do I have to get involved? Do I have to sign a contract for you to no. tell me what my practice is worth? No, 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 no. We, what, what, know, is it, what does it what does it cost for me to find out what zero. my practice zero and Nothing. and how would they start that process? So, largepracticesales.com is my website. You can read about what we do. But basically, we are in the education business. My goal is to educate every dentist on why an invisible DSO partnership is something they should understand. Now, it may or may not be the right fit for them, but ultimately, every larger practice in this country is going to join an invisible DSO or compete with many. Virtually everybody listening to this podcast has an invisible DSO practice in their town and they don't know it because these groups don't come in and announce, Hey, we just partnered with Dr. Jones. They want you to continue right, continue to operate under your brand with your team and your strategy. They, they don't want to rock the boat. So the invisible DSOs are, are very powerful and valuable, but it's not a fit for everybody. So what we urge every doctor to do is set up a call with me, Let's have a conversation for about 20 minutes, learn a little bit about each other. And if you're interested in the whole concept, uh, we're going to take a look at two years of P&Ls and we're going to give you an idea of what's possible from a value perspective. And you're going to either like that number or you won't. And if you don't, that's okay. You got a free practice valuation and I guarantee, and I'll put it in writing, you'll learn something. Oh, absolutely. Um, they, they, dentists love to work with their hands. And, the, and if you do a course on occlusion, a trillion dentists will show up. <laughs> and then you run a course on, you know, why is my overhead, you know, 89%. Or uh, people showed up. Yeah, yeah, no, no one shows up. And uh, it, it's, <laughs> it's just a, um, um, but, but and I, I want to ask you some questions that um, are coming all the time. Um, what do you do when you're in a city um, where hygienists are getting $80 an hour and insurance is paying you 60 for a cleaning? I mean, we you talk about this past COVID deal about the inflation has really jacked up labor prices. I think it scared off uh, about 20 to 30% of all the hygienists and nurses. Um, everybody I talk to in Phoenix say, every hospital say, we don't have any nurses. The COVID was the last straw. So, so if everybody's down 20, 30% of all the nurses and hygienists and the remaining ones have bid up the prices real high and that that's a huge labor deal. Um, what, what, what's a, what's a person do to combat their high overhead? You know, I have no idea because the hygienists are going to get paid, but the hygienists are going to get paid. However, some of the invisible DSOs have been following an interesting plan where they're offering equity ownership to non doctors such that your hygienist pool or your office manager can become equity owners in the invisible DSO and therefore have golden handcuffs that basically says here, we're the invisible DSO. We've partnered with your boss, uh, Dr. Ferran, and uh, we're going to give you $50,000 of equity in our company that we expect is going to increase in value by three to five times in the next three to five years. But if you leave, you forfeit that equity. So the invisible DSOs are fighting the high cost of labor and the turnover issues by providing equity to team members, not just doctors, not just associates, but also full team members within the practice. And that's pretty powerful. It's tough to recruit against that because your hygienist is making $65 an hour is not going to go down the street to make $68 an hour because she's now an equity holder. 
And, and that is a, a rapidly expanding thing in our world. I also want to say something. I mean, would, would you just agree off the top of your head? I mean, would, I gave you stats earlier that pedodontists, orthodontists, and oral surgeons make a shitload more money than general dentists. Depends. Depends, right? I, I, I was on the phone today with an oral surgeon whose EBITDA is $200,000, and I was on the phone with a GP today whose EBITDA is a million eight. Because it, one, because one of the things I I the first jumped out at me about your dental trifecta is, you know I I'm my MBA from Arizona State University I love economics and um, one of the things they always say is that spending like old people like me I don't ever buy anything, but I but money goes downward like 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 mom's not gonna buy ten thousand dollars with veneers on her teeth she's gonna buy I mean she's not gonna buy veneers on her teeth she's gonna buy braces on her child. Hell she's yeah. not going to buy, you know, she's not going to go get a facelift. She's going to get her son's wisdom teeth taken out. Parents spend money down. And for three decades in Phoenix, Arizona, a lot of moms said, well, I just can't afford that for little Billy, but let me talk to grandma. And grandma right. every time is like, hell yeah, I'll pay for Billy's braces or things like that. So, so pedo, ortho, oral surgeon, that's, that's old people spending on the youth. And I, and I always tell the dentist, why are you going to go spend all this money on old people dentistry on occlusion and full mouth rehab? And I mean, I cannot tell you how many times a grandpa would come in his teeth were garbage and all that stuff. And I'd say, you know, why don't you fix this up? Maybe they're so bad. They're scaring my grandkids. He goes, the hell it's scaring the grandkids. Who do you think's paying for their college? And he would rather pay for his college than do a full mouth rehab. Yeah, so man, when you're, when you're, when you're in the, when you realize that, all that money travels down to baby boo boo, and yep. uh, and if mom don't have it, and as soon as mom runs out of money, then grandma's gonna get drained. And if uh, and if and if grand and if they don't have enough money, they'll just start feeding grandpa bacon 24 hours a day until <laughs> he he uh, uh cash out the life and policy. But it's just a lot mo- better money when you're going in business spending on things that babies need pediatric dentistry, ortho, and then the other thing about ortho is um. A lot of orthodontists claim about the competition. When I grew up in Kansas, you know, big Catholic families, if you had seven kids, the only kid that got braces is the one that could never get married with those teeth. I mean, if you could <laughs> eat corn on the cob through a chain link fence or like we better put, and it was always the girls. Like we'll fix up Megan, not Billy. Billy could have like a missing eye and he's good. He's just a boy. <laughs> but now I notice the kids get braces in, in uh, grammar school, high school, They'll get them again when they're 30. They'll get them again at their, you know, at their first divorce, 40, 50, whatever. I mean, braces is like three times. It's, it's like a lifetime thing now where it used to be a, just the, you know, scorched earth, you know, just the ugliest kid gets it. Now everybody's getting it multiple times. So I, I really like pedo, ortho, and oral surgery. I mean, uh, you know, well, love, it, love that a lot. It, it has proven to be the most valuable of the invisible DSOs. And at the moment, so if if we have a pedo or an ortho and oral surgery client, they're going to have bidders from the pedo only groups, the pedo ortho groups or the trifecta groups. The oral surgeon is going to have bidders from the oral surgery only invisible DSOs, of which there are now 17. Think about that. There are 17 oral surgery only invisible DSOs. Six years ago, there were zero. Seven years ago, there were zero ortho-only invisible DSOs. Today, there are 14. So you, you've had this dramatic interest in uh, specialty and the, uh, billions of dollars put into these groups eager to do that. The trifecta has proven to be the best of all of those models. So um, do, are these guys all competing with you and hurting you? Or are you no, no, no. These, are, they, no these are the people that I am partnering my clients with. They're not competing with me. The invisible DSOs that, you know, 14 ortho only invisible DSOs is great because that means I have half of them are qualified, but I've got seven new qualified bidders for my ortho clients. And they're competing with the trifecta groups and they're competing with the multi-specialty groups because something that most orthos don't grasp is while there are 14 ortho only invisible DSOs out there, some of the multi-specialty groups have more orthos than any of the ortho only invisible DSOs with the exception of one. So it's, there's a lot of things that dentists don't know. And that's our job is to try and help educate them on the different opportunities that are possible. You know, I can't straighten teeth. I can't uh, place a crown. That's not what I do. And so dentists who try and do these deals by themselves are insane. 
because they they think, oh, I went to school to be an investment banker. No, you didn't. You went to school to straighten teeth. Come on. Yeah. So uh, when we see dentists who do their own do-it-yourself uh, deals, they don't even do it. basic stuff like run. They'll sign a ten-year lease and won't run it by a real estate attorney. I tell the story. I know a buddy. Just one tenant in an 8,000 square foot building. Just had 2,000 square foot. But the, it was a triple net lease. The roof crashed. Something all screwed up. And it was going to be this big bill. So the next door, the, the Bikram Yoga deal. Oh, yeah, she took off. The little yogurt deal. She just closed business. Guess who got the entire bill for the entire damn thing? And he's like, well, how could they do that? I'm like, well, I would sue your attorney. I'd sue the real estate attorney <laughs> for not protecting. And he's like, I didn't use one. It's like, duh. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know they yeah we, uh, you know socrates said what was it, a doctor who treats himself as a fool for a patient i and, think that was about lawyers wasn't it well well what did charlie munger say he said the he says you don't have to be smart just quit being stupid stay in your circle of competency <laughs> that's a great comment i like that's that. what, i'm using that's what, it i'm stealing yeah, that from you yeah that's what he always says he says you know me and warren we're not smart we just don't do stupid stuff and we stay in a very small circle of competency and, and they asked warren just this last deal they said you know he, he told him he said you know I loved railroads. I'm in Omaha. I love the sound of them. I like watching them. So when I got the the Moody's book and there's like 20,000 stocks, I just read the 4,000 railroad stocks. And he goes, so when I was reading it, I, I loved reading it. I just loved railroads. So he says, find something you love and a circle of competence and, and get interested in it. But, um, um, but I, I want to, I can't believe we're over an hour now, but I, I want to, um, switch gears. I know that you're, you know, you're, um, looking for dentists who want to sell some of their equity, but I, I want you to go somewhere else. Um, I want you to talk to my uh, the young graduates. You know, she got out of school two or three years ago. She's a half million in debt. She's a working in some DSO where the office manager treats her like, you know, cattle and the office manager is running like eight different locations. Like they do at subway and Burger King. And she hates, she's not a happy camper. She's not happy. She, she thinks she's made a bad decision. She's got a half million dollars in debt. She's got a job she hates. She doesn't see a way out. What Talk to that girl. What, what do you think she should do? How should she think? You know, the, you know, the biggest challenge of any independent dental practice is finding great associates who want to work. Not just work doing dentistry, but to help expand the practice. I can't tell you how many times I talk to dentists that go, yeah, I just got rid of an associate because, of, you know, they, they worked eight to four and they didn't go help me expand the practice. So someone who's frustrated in a situation, there are, in, in any community, there are dozens of dentists eager for a great associate that will help them build that business. Not just come in and do the dentistry, but go out and do the knocking on doors, talking to people, being a marketing person. So if you just want to grind on teeth, you're probably in the right place. You're in, a, you're in one of the chain DSOs and you're banging out teeth. But there are so many independent dentists out there that are eager to bring in an associate that wants to get involved, that wants to help, that wants to do the community outreach to help grow the practice. And that's becoming a lost art, in my opinion, just based on the doctors I talk to every day. And, and every, every great dentist is eager to find a great associate. Today, many of them are very frustrated with the associates that they have found. Oh, yeah. I mean, you ask him to go, hey, February is Dental Health Month. You want to go to the local Loma Linda uh, Grammar School and teach the second graders? Well, am I going to get paid? How much will I get paid for that? And it's like, I thought no. you were a dentist. I, I thought you should. I thought this was your mission. I mean, is it a is it an occupation or do you have a vocation? I always thought it was a vocation. I remember asking people in dental school, would you jump in front of a train and get demolished if it resulted in the end of all dental disease, there'd never be another cavity or gum disease. And ever and, and half the classmates say, no. It's like, <laughs> okay, well, I know I know my sisters that are nuns, they, they don't consider it a job. They don't even get paid money. I mean, they, they consider it a vocation. I always thought a dentistry was a vocation. And uh, I, I think that's changed a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, if if you're not really in I mean, I think if someone drops you down into zip code and you practice for 30 years, if you don't lower the disease of missing and filled tooth stats for your zip code, what the hell were you doing? 
I mean, I remember when I opened up my practice, and people thought I was nuts because I, I canceled the first every Friday because Phoenix didn't have water fluoridation. I said, well, this is stupid. We're drilling and filling on an assembly line. Why they can't even fluoridate their water to half the level found in the ocean? And every Friday, our staff would go down, and there was eight city councilmen, and uh, Calvin Good was ours, and then the mayor Terry Goddard, and and I, and they go, and they start saying like, "We've already seen us three times." I said, "We're going to see you every Friday till we die, or you fluoridate the water." And just tell me <laughs> what your pushback was. And and you know they give pushback like Calvin Good said, "Well, I got people that uh, have." Orange gardens and orange citrus trees. And uh, what about, and then we go get the National Orange Tree Association to send a letter of endorsement. And they'd say, what about our little dogs? The vet? We just kept answering all their questions until finally they took a vote on it and they, they, they passed it. But, but you know, it, it's a vocation. It's an attitude. And, uh, but I, but I noticed that when I was, uh, my dad got into Sonic and when I was about 10, we drove down to Dallas six hours and saw a Ray Kroc lecture. And I, I, they didn't really pick this up in the movie, but you can see it with Chick-fil-A now where, um, you know, McDonald's and Chick-fil-A. And by the way, Chick-fil-A, you know, they don't have the same 30,000 stores as McDonald's, but McDonald's is about $3 million a store, and Chick-fil-A blew right past them to $5 million, And yep. Chick-fil-A is not even closed on Sunday. They, they closed for this habit. And both of them, Ray Kroc used to say it privately, and it didn't make the movie, but Chick Fil A says openly they would they only give you one one store one franchise you're not gonna it's not like Burger King or where they're gonna give you eleven right. stores you know can't manage that they're gonna only give you one store and they're and not gonna give it to it. you unless you got a stay home spouse and kids and they're like man you got to stay and, and what I found in Arizona man you you got you get you get to a state you get to a dentist. That's got a stay home spouse. And then my first one um, that was a woman and a stay home man raising two kids. Um, but the, the bottom line is you, you get a dentist and their spouse doesn't work in his home. I mean, you basically own a slave. I right. mean, they will give you their whole life. And then how do you find passion? Well, you know what? How do you find passion scraping teeth and making gas? Cause you know why you find passion job? Because if that career choice of yours is paying for your wife and spouse and children and give them the lifestyle and send them to school. That's the love and respect that, that gives you the love of your passion. Like, hell yeah, I love dentistry. I've got a great lifestyle. I, my kids, you know, it, when, when you're making money and you're successful, you develop the passion. But the advice that, that oh yeah, well, why'd you become a dentist? Well, I, I, I just love bad breath and I thought I want to <laughs> scrape tartar and puss off people's teeth all day. Uh, my, uh, my kid's um, uncle, owns the largest construction company in Kansas. And he, and his brother was always embarrassed about being telling people he was a construction worker. And he's like, dude, we're making bank. We're taking care of our families. We're going to Disneyland on vacation. And he just fell in love with construction. And my other neighbor had the biggest gasket company. I mean, just a gasket baller. And, he, and he, it's like, so man, when you get successful and you're making bank, you know, you, you, you the, the passion will follow, but it all starts with the right attitude. I agree with that a hundred percent. And that's why I always say to a doctor, he says, well, what do you think I can get to my practice? I said, well, I think the bids will start at $10 million. And he said, well, how do I get more than $10 million? I said, well, you need to have a personality and a plan. If you have a personality and a growth plan, you're going to get more money. So how do my homies contact you? Largepracticesales.com. Hey, um, I could talk to you for 40 days and 40 nights. And by the way, have I known you a long time? I mean, I've known you when you lived in uh, Texas, Florida. Now you're saying Maryland. Uh, are you running from the law or the, no, uh, no, well, no, what the no. hell is going our, on here? Our headquarters is still Dallas, Texas, always has been. My favorite office, because I'm a boataholic, is Fort Lauderdale. We oh, okay. Have a beautiful waterfront office. Oh, you're in, in Maryland Lauderdale. now, right? I am in Maryland now looking at the water at a boat. So when you say you're a boater, does that mean you're a fisherman too? All of the above. Yeah. But uh, my gosh, um, that, that is so cool. But hey, I just want to seriously thank you for coming on and talking no, about this subject. Me. Great I, to I talk liked, to you. I liked your no holds barred, no question too soft. Uh, it, was, it was just an honor and a privilege to podcast you. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you. I hope you have a great evening. All right, buddy. You too. Have a good one.